we get four degenerate, aka equal energy, hybridized orbitals. Since to make these four degenerate orbitals, we used one s orbital and three p orbitals, we call these hybridized orbitals sp3, a wonderfully apropos name for orbitals that are made by combining 1s orbital and 3p orbitals. Again, please note that these orbitals are equal in energy, degenerate, and the energy is somewhere in between the energy levels of the s and p orbitals that were used to make them. The idea with three electron domains is pretty similar, except this time we only have these three electrons to worry about, so once again we are going to excite it to get each of these electrons in their own orbital, and then we're going to take these three orbitals and combine them together. When we combine these three orbitals, we end up creating three hybridized orbitals. So three atomic orbitals go in, three hybridized orbitals come out. Because we're combining one s orbital and two p orbitals, we call these sp two orbitals, a wildly original name. Notice that we left one p orbital outside of the mix. This one unhybridized p orbital left behind is going to become very important with double bonds and with delocalized electrons, but more on that in a little bit. Next, let's look at our last scenario when we have two electron domains. Once again, we've got our ground state with these two electrons, and whoop pow We're going to excite one of these electrons so that now we have um, a 1s, or sorry, a 2s electron and a 2p electron, so they're each in their own orbital now. And now we're going to take this solitary s orbital and the solitary p orbital and mix them together. And when we mix together these two atomic orbitals, we get two degenerate hybridized orbitals. And since this, these hybridized orbitals only combine together a single s orbital and a single p orbital, we're just going to call these sp hybridized. Now I'm going to fill in, put in the electrons, including the ones for the sp2 ones that I forgot to put in before. Voila! And then finally, just want to note that when we make um, our two sp hybridized orbitals, in this case, we're leaving behind two unhybridized p orbitals. These two unhybridized p orbitals will become significant when we look at triple bonds, for example. So that's the general idea behind hybridization. Now let's look at a really easy, and I would argue fun, way of assigning hybridization to a given atom. Presenting the sp -b 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 -d -d rule. That's right, the sp -b 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 -d -d rule. It is a powerful, useful, and fun way of assigning hybridization to atoms. And here's how it works. For any given atom that you're trying to find the hybridized orbitals around, you're going to first count the number of electron domains, um, or branches of electrons, that that atom has. And note that single, double, and triple bonds, they all just count as one electron domain. Lone pairs of electrons also count as electron domains, and if you're dealing with a single radical electron, that also counts as an electron domain. Next, you're going to write out the word sp -b 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 -d -d. That's right, sp -b 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 -d -d. Once you have that written out, what you're going to do is count over um, however many characters there are as the number of electron domains on your atom. So, for example, if there are two electron domains, you count over one, two, and you end up getting sp hybridized. If there are three electron domains, you count over one, two, three, and you get sp2 hybridized. If there are th four electron domains, one, two, three, and four, you end up with sp3 hybridized. It's that simple. Let's get to it. We're going to be once again looking at our friend acetaminophen and um, figuring out the hybridized orbitals around a number of different atoms here. So why don't we just start off with this carbon 
on the end. Remember, this point here represents a carbon. And using the rule of skeletal structures, we can assume that this carbon has its valence satisfied and that there would be three hydrogens coming off of it. Okay, so now let's find the hybridization on this carbon. This carbon has four single bonds, so it's got one, two, three, four electron domains. We write out da And just as a quick note, truth be told, we likely won't be invoking these d orbitals. In fact, there's some argument in the chemical chemical communities as to if the d orbitals truly participate in these hybridizations or not. Um, but it's more fun to say sp -p 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 -da -da than it is to say sp -p 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 -p. so we're going to roll with it. Since our carbon has four electron domains, we're going to start the S. We're going to count over one, two, three, four. Same number of electron domains as there are. So that means that our carbon is sp3 hybridized. Cool. See, fast, easy, and fun. Next, let's go with this carbon right here. This carbon's got three electron domains. It's got one here for that single bond. It's got one here for that double bond. And it's got one here for that double bond. Oh, sorry, so we've got two single bonds and one double bond, each of which count as one electron domain. So there are a total of three electron domains here. Since there are three electron domains, we'll write out and we'll count over one, two, three. Okay, that means that that carbon is sp2 hybridized. And note the implications of this. If it's sp2 hybridized, that means that it has still this one unhybridized p orbital. That p orbital is going to be what allows it to make a double bond. Next, let's do this oxygen right here. So recall that this oxygen, um, we can assume with the skeletal structure that it obeys the octet rule, which means that it would have two lone pairs of electrons that are not explicitly drawn in. Okay, so that means that we are looking at a total of one, two, three electron domains. Remember, each lone pair counts as one electron domain, and the double bond only counts as one electron domain. So... That means that we're looking at one, two, three. So this oxygen here is sp2 hybridized. Once again, it's got an unhybridized p orbital, and that's going to come into play with the double bond. And just for posterity's sake, let's look at one of the carbons in our aromatic ring over here. Let's go with this one. Recall that it has a hydrogen that need not be explicitly drawn in. So we count the electron domains, one, two, and three. And then we go over one, two, three. So this carbon, just like the previous oxygen and the previous carbon that we looked at, is sp2 hybridized. So in this particular case, we don't have an example of sp hybridization, but we'll look at that in just a moment when we talk about um, triple bonds. So as a quick summary, if there are four electron remains, that means that we're looking at sp3 hybridization. Our electron domain geometry, recall, with four electron domains is tetrahedral that holds true with our hybridized orbitals. And recall that the approximate angle for tetrahedral electron domain geometry is 109.5 degrees. Now remember that can be influenced by double, bears and double bonds and lone pairs, um, but in general that's uh, the approximate angle that we're looking at. And then finally, this leaves zero unhybridized p orbitals remaining. If there are three electron domains, then using our rule, end up getting that we have sp2 hybridization. With sp2 hybridization, we're looking at trigonal planar electron domain geometry and the approximate angles of 
120 degrees. Finally, that leaves behind one unhybrid sp orbital that can be potentially utilized for double bonds or for delocalization, resonance. We'll talk about that in a moment. Lastly, if we only have two electron domains, then we're looking at sp hybridized orbitals. That's going to give us a linear shape, and the approximate angle for linear is a cool 180 degrees. Finally, if we're only invoking one p orbital to go into our hybridized orbitals, that means that we're going to be left with two unhybridized p orbitals that are going to be able to maybe make two double bonds or maybe a triple bond. Let's take a closer look. Now let's talk about single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds, and what they consist of. So valence bond theory suggests that the creation of covalent bonds is through the overlapping of orbitals. So let's look at this molecule ethane, ethane C2H6. First of all, what's the hybridization on each carbon? Well, using the rule, we can find that each of them is sp3 hybridized. So, how does it form its bonds? So on the left we have a schematic of, or a depiction of all the atoms that make up ethane, and we've got our carbons. Each carbon has its respective four sp3 hybridized orbitals, those lobes that are depicted there. So there are those sp3 hybridized orbitals, those lobes are labeled on the left-hand one. And then we've got our hydrogens. The hydrogens are fairly boring in this respect. They can't really hybridize, they just have that one s electron. So these are just going to be run-of-the-mill s orbitals. So what happens is the s orbitals from hydrogen overlap with the sp3 orbitals of carbon, and then further we have this orbital overlap from the sp3 orbital of carbon, the left-hand carbon, and the sp3 orbital, um, one of the sp3 orbitals from the right-hand carbon. So all of these orbi orbitals overlap and we end up with oh, our molecule, ethane. This direct overlapping of orbitals, be them hybridized, like the sp3 hybridized orbitals from carbon, or the unhybridized orbital from hydrogen, creates what's called a sigma bond. So we have a sigma bond from the direct overlap of these two sp3 hybridized orbitals from carbon. So we end up with a total of seven sigma bonds in this molecule. So in short, a really quick and good rule of thumb is that single bonds consist of one sigma bond. So if you're ever trying to calculate the number of sigma bonds in a molecule, um, first of all, any single bond you see, it counts as one sigma bond. But what of double bonds and triple bonds? Well, we'll see that they each contain one sigma bond as well. But let's take a closer look at what's going on with them right now. Let's look at this molecule. Um, so this molecule is called ethylene, and it's got a carbon-carbon double bond. So first of all, what's the hybridization on each carbon? Well, we can write out sp -b -b -d -d. We can see that each carbon has got, count them, one, two, three electron domains. So this is for this particular carbon here, but it's the same story for the other carbon which leaves us with SPP, SP2 hybridization. Cool. Recall that SP2 hybridization leaves behind one unhybridized P orbital, and that's per carbon. So what does that P orbital do? Let's take a closer look. Let's do that. We're going to take kind of a side view of our ethylene molecule here. So here we're kind of looking at the side. We've got these two hydrogens that are coming out towards us, and we've got these two hydrogens that are going away from us. So we're looking vaguely above the plane that these are in. So each of these carbons has an unhybridized p orbital. So each of these carbons has an unhybridized p orbital. Recall that p orbitals are dumbbell shaped. 
And those p orbitals exist perpendicular to the trigonal planar plane um, that's created by the sp2 hybridized orbitals. Okay, so what we're left with is these two p orbitals that are above and below this internuclear axis. And what is it that they do? Well, it turns out that these orbitals can overlap indirectly. I'm going to indicate this indirect overlap, like so, to create what's called a pi bond. So pi bonds are created by the indirect overlap of p orbitals. And so just note that we've got this overlap going above and below the carbons. That represents one single pi bond. And you might be asking yourself, well, what do the colors represent? That's a great question. And that's sort of out of the scope of this valence bond theory. Um, it means that these um, electron wave functions are in sync with each other. But that's a story for a different day. So don't worry about the color coding here. So how many bonds and what type of bonds are in our molecule of ethylene? So remember, each carbon is sp2 hybridized, which creates these orbitals that are 120 degrees apart from each other. So we've got hybridized orbitals from the carbon on the left and the hybridized orbitals from the carbon on the right. These orbitals are overlapping with the s orbitals of each hydrogen to create a total of four sigma bonds between the carbons and the hydrogens. And we also have a sigma bond created from the direct overlap of the sp2 and the sp2 hybridized orbitals from the carbon. So in total we've got five sigma bonds. And we also have the pi bond that we mentioned before. So we've got our five sigma bonds and one pi bond. So whereas each sig single bond is a sigma bond, each double bond is a combination of one sigma and one pi. On the note of pi bonds, something that I should point out quickly is when you look at just single bonds, like we have with ethane, single bonds have the ability to have free rotation about them. Um, they're not really locked into place per se. So this actually has important implications on molecular structure, especially when you look at larger molecules um, with lots and lots of atoms, because there's this rotation that can occur around single bonds. So single bonds have free rotation, and as we can see, basically, this side of the molecule here, um, we have each hydrogen represented with a different color. They can move about, so they can spin kind of like a pinwheel, almost. That, however, is not the case with pi bonds, because pi bonds lock our atoms in place. So you can kind of think about it as if you have um, two different pieces of wood connected with one dowel, you can rotate those pieces of wood around. If you attach that second dowel in, well now we have not only that sigma bond, but also the pi bond, it's locking these atoms in place. So we do not get free rotation with um, pi bonds. And we'll see that it has implications with both double bonds and with triple bonds. Speaking of triple bonds, let's talk about triple bonds. Triple bonds. What's the deal with triple bonds? Well, let's look at this molecule, acetylene. So acetylene, popular in um, torches, is a molecule that has two carbons that are triple bonded together. Each of those carbon has one hydrogen to satisfy its valence. What's the hybridization on each carbon? We'll do a dramatic pause, like Dora the Explorer, and see if you get it. So what is the hybridization on each carbon? You got it! Each carbon has two electron domains, so there's a triple bond and the single bond. You got it! Each carbon is sp hybridized. So, that sp hybridization means that our carbons here have a linear electron domain geometry. So, this is actually um, a linear molecule completely because there's 180 degrees this bond and 180 degrees at this bond, so everything actually exists in a line. 
The other implication here is that there are two unhybridized p orbitals on each carbon. So what do they do? Do they do things? Let's find out. So each carbon has an unhybridized p orbital, not only above and below the internuclear axis, but also, let's try to depict this, in front of and behind this internuclear axis. Sorry, the drawing doesn't look great, but we'll roll with it. So what this means is that now we've got the indirect overlap of not only the first p orbitals, but also the second p orbitals, which creates not one, but two pi bonds. One above and below the internuclear axis, that one there, and one in front of and behind the internuclear axis. Long story long, that means that triple bonds consist of one sigma bond, and not one, but two pi bonds. So triple bonds are the most delicious type of bond of them all. One sigma and two pi. Finally, delocalized electrons. Well, what are delocalized electrons? These are electrons that we observe when we have resonance structures. So we'll see that overlapping p orbitals, um, if you've got three or more, will allow for uh, these delocalized electrons, kind of an electron superhighway. So let's just do an example of a molecule that has resonance. So let's look at nitrate NO3 minus. If we draw the Lewis structure for nitrate, it looks like this. And you know what? Let's include the formal charges for posterity's sake. Cool. But is this the only way that we can draw this molecule? Nay! We can draw it two other ways. We could alternatively draw it like this, or we could also draw it like... like this. So we have three possible resonance structures, all of which are equally viable. And remember, none of these resonance structures actually depicts an exact snapshot of what's going on. Rather, um, they create a compromise. So each of these represents something that's sort of true, but not completely true. To analyze this more further, let's take a look at the bond order. So remember, the bond order we can get by focusing in on one particular set of nitrogen-oxygen bonds. So I'm going to go with this set here. So I'm going to look at that, I'm going to look at this, and I'm going to look at that. So the nitrogen and oxygen above it. Okay, so what we do is we calculate the total number of bonds across all the resonance structures. In this case, there's two from this one, there's one from this one, and, oops, sorry, typo. There's one from this one, one from this one, and two from this one. So that gives us a total of four. And we divide this by the total number of resonance structures. In this case, there are three structures. So what this ends up giving us is a bond order of 1.33. So what does that mean? A one and a third bond? Well, it means that the length is somewhere in between that of a single bond and a double bond. It means the strength is somewhere in between that of a single bond and a double bond. But it also means we have delocalized electrons. So what's happening is the unhybridized p orbitals from each of these oxygens is actually sharing these electrons. They're on an electron superhighway that can be appreciated by looking at the resonance hybrid depiction of this molecule. So here we have the resonance hybrid, and these dotted lines mean um, they're representing the delocalized electrons, these pi electrons that are being shared between multiple atoms. So here we have a depiction of what's going on here. Essentially, each of these atoms has an unhybridized p orbital that allows for resonance. In order to have resonance, an atom must have an unhybridized p orbital, at least one. So these p orbitals can all overlap and create this electron superhighway. We also observe a similar phenomenon in the molecule benzene, which looks like this. We can depict benzene this way, or this way. So, is it just that it keeps alternating single bonds and double bonds? No, we've got delocalized pi electrons that are part of an electron superhighway. Alright, thus concludes this talk about um, skeletal structures, hybridization, 
bonds, and delocalized electrons. Thank you for tuning in, and have a wonderful day.